Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we are here bringing you another fabulous episode with another incredible guest. We have the amazing Trent Pearson with us today. How are you this morning, Trent? I'm great. Thank you. We are so excited you're here. And I have to tell a little background because just the strangest things happen to us on Mormonish. So as Landon and I are like studying things, looking through things, we're always like, dang, I wish we could talk to a, you know, botanist, or I wish we could talk. So the last month or so we've been going, ah, we really need to find a linguist. We have some questions. We need to find a linguist. So that's kind of been in the back of our mind. So we go to this gathering, a post-Mormon gathering at this, you know, fun pub. And we're all sitting there and new people have shown up. It's it's a regular thing. And there's always new people. And when, there's Trent. And we start talking to Trent because he looks like a very interesting person. And all of a sudden we learn, what is he, Landon? <laughs> yeah, he's a linguist. He's a linguist. And, and not, not just any linguist. He uh, he makes up his own languages in fact <laughs> that's right this is the other icing on the cake to this whole thing not only is he a linguist and we're going to have an amazing conversation today but he has been involved in inventing the romulan language for different star trek episodes and everyone knows i'm a huge geek so it was just a really funny night because we meet trent he's a romulan uh linguist and then another one of our friends we've had on the show before, Joel, if you remember Bishop Joel, I think he'd been on a trip or something. He walks up to the table. He goes, Rebecca, I just got this for you. And it's little people, you know, those little toys, but they're Star Trek characters. So I'm like, this is some kind of weird vortex. I'm having the greatest night in the world. So anyway, we have Trent with us today and we're going to delve into some really interesting topics that really need a linguist to unpack for us. So let's have you read the bio really quick, Landon, and then we will just get started. And we're just so excited that you're here, Trent. Thank okay. you. Yes, Trent Pearson. Uh, he's born in Alpine, Utah, into a devout, multi-generational LDS family. He began constructing languages, uh, co-languing, at age five. He studied Spanish, Latin, and Russian in high school. He graduated uh, from American Fork High School. I didn't know that you could take all the languages in high school, so that's uh, pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Called to serve an LDS mission in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, he returned early from that. As an undergrad, he studied Mandarin and graduated with a BA in computational linguistics. He began master's work but transferred to UVU, at the time UVSU, to study computer science. His career has involved full stack programming, systems integration, data analysis, localization, language recognition programming, constructed language development, systems architecture, and system analysis in the private and public sectors. So quite an accomplished linguist and computer scientist, which uh, pretty much go hand in hand, I'm guessing, anymore uh, with translation of languages and whatnot. So. Yeah, you, you can't do much with language that's helpful without computers these days. <laughs> I, but, I think it's fair to say you're more than a writer researcher when it comes to languages. That's it, exactly. We hear that term <laughs> lots of times on Scripture Central and Book of Mormon Central when they bring out their experts and they say, we're a writer slash researcher. We've always tried to figure out what that means exactly. So, <laughs> no, we're really I just consider Can myself I another ape. And that's it. That's exactly right. And just as a little side note, can you just tell us how you got involved in the world of Star Trek? I'm sorry, this is so fascinating. For those of you that don't know Romulans, you've probably heard of Klingons, but there's another, you know, world out there in the multiverse. And these are the Romulans. So can you just tell us really quickly what you do in, in that capacity? Sure. So um, just in a thumbnail, from a young age, I started creating languages. And I recognized very early that that was weird. And I was told so by many people. That didn't deter me, though. It was so, it was just such a big part of me that I just did it anyway. Um, it wasn't until I was in high school, you know, I'd studied all those languages because I loved language. And it wasn't until high school that I realized there was a field called linguistics that had people like me in it, you know? So I got really interested in that. And then when the internet came along, um, I don't know if you guys remember bulletin boards, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I found a bulletin board of other people, not just linguists, but other people who create languages. And that was like, um, I, I thought I was the only person in the world. I, I had never met anyone else around me. They all thought it was weird and no one else did it. So 
when I met this, this small group of people, I was thrilled. And there were, there were maybe 10 or 12 of us on this bulletin board. Well, some of those people and that little group of extraordinary but statistically anomalous people um, ended up being the David Petersons and the Paul Fromers and um, Mark Ockrens that have been creating languages for, for different movies. So wow. actually through my connections to them and the work that I had done and put online, um, I became lucky enough to be um, recommended to Paramount and CBS. And they asked me to to actually develop a full language for Romulan. I've also done a little bit of work on other Trek languages, but and I, I've I've done work for for authors and for other production companies too. But it started with um, doing some work on Picard, and then they asked me to do work on other series. Um, the most recent work I have done is on the current season of Discovery, and so that was fun to see that finally finally come out. And that's been a very, I feel lucky that I that I got to do that. It's not because I'm some special skilled person or some special conlinger. It was, it really was a lot of luck that I that allowed me to do that. So, so does your luck. name roll up in the credits at the end? Do we get to see that? Yes, I'm, I'm credited in oh, some great. of those. The coolest thing is, um, I can't remember which series or episode it is, but there's one where I'm credited right next to Mark Ockrand. He created the Klingon language. Wow. And for me, that was a geek out because when I was 12, <laughs> my best yeah. friend gave me the Klingon dictionary. Yep. And that's when I learned about Mark Ockrand. And I was like, <laughs> yep. oh, I want to do this, you know? Yep. So I had this kind of full circle connection moment when I saw my name in the credits next to Mark Ockrand. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Wow. See, I wish we would have known each other when we were little because I also had the Klingon dictionary. Um, I never mastered it. My mom mastered the Klingon language. She speaks Klingon. She's in her 80s now. I know you guys have no idea how geeky I am. I'm <laughs> sorry. So cool. I'm revealing it here, but but I will say luck, but then you have the skill to back up your luck. So this is just amazing. We are just really honored to have you here. So I think, you know, if you'll indulge me for a second. Yeah. Let's just make this whole episode about Klingon. We don't need to talk about the Anton Travscript. Let's forget it, Landon. We're just I, talking about I was always hoping I'd get called on a Klingon-speaking mission, but I, <laughs> I went to Indiana, so uh, no, no such luck. <laughs> yeah, Klingon could be a whole a whole uh, a fun episode in and of itself. It um, could. It really could. That's so I have some Were you looking for the dictionary did... back there, or were you... I have my original copy, but I can't. I can't oh, remember where I put it. But it's somewhere uh, back there. Yeah. Yeah. And for for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, you know, some of these sci-fi programs are very serious. When you have a character and a race like Klingon, you have to have an entire language, you know, that you can communicate in. So they're not just speaking gibberish, you know, on the shows. There actually is a language behind what they're doing, and now we know there's a Romulan language. So this is amazing. So this All becomes right. yeah, important. The reason we're speaking ab about this is because uh, we want to address some of the uh, linguistic issues that we've seen come up uh, in apologetics, yep. uh, specifically the Anton characters, yep. uh, Nahome, some of these linguistic uh, items that the apologists like to use as proof of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to have an actual linguist look at these and, and give his feedback on it. Yep. And Trent agreed to do that. So we yep. appreciate so it. That's what we're talking about today. So I think you do have a slide. I don't know if you're starting with your slide, but why don't you go ahead and take it away now? We will stop pestering you about Star Trek. <laughs> okay. Before I start, I just wanted to mention two quick things. So um, the first one is I am a linguist and I do have a linguistic background, but I'm not the kind of linguist that works at a university and rubs my nose in the expert details and cutting edge of linguistic progress every day. So I want to make sure that that's clear. Um, and I'm, I'm approaching this topic from the point of view of um, how analysis of this text um, intersected with faith for me. So it's, it's both a personal point of view and it's, it's talking about how it intersected with my faith. I'm not, I'm not claiming here to be um, an expert on the Anton transcription. 
I'm just explaining how my linguistic background, which is legitimate, comes to bear for me personally as it intersects with my faith. Um, the second thing that's important to me um, in a spirit of amity and deference to consent, because we are talking about things that challenge faith, if someone's watching this and having faith challenged, or at least the potential to have a convincing argument against faith is something that you can't tolerate or don't want to hear, then this is your chance to stop. So, because we are going to be, we are going to be discussing that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I'm so happy that you said that. And I respect that, of course. And, and I think a lot of our guests on the show, wouldn't you agree, Landon, say that? They say, this is my journey. This is my interpretation. This is how I synthesize. Mm -hmm. And there's value in sharing that. But that is what you're saying. This is this is me. And that's great. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, um, I think we can start with the slide, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, so... Um, the approach that I take whenever I hear a claim is, I kind of think of it as like a dot to dot. So I start with the claim on one side and the dot that I'm trying to connect to is some kind of confidence or confirmation of the claim on the other side. And we can connect any two dots really, if we want to with faith, just with faith. We can say, I believe that, that this is true and, and therefore I'm going to consider it as a truth, right? Or as a reality. For now, and I wanna come back to this at the end, we're not gonna allow that, okay? So for, for me personally, I had to take a moment to, to set faith aside and see if I could fill that gap between the claim and the confirmed claim without using faith. And at the end of all this, I'll explain why that was important to me and, and how that had meaning for me. So we have this claim. Um, the Anton transcript contains glyphs transcribed directly from the gold plates in the writing of the Egyptians and the learning of the Jews. This establishes the historicity of the Book of Mormon and the reality of the gold plates. Okay. So people have made this claim and other claims about the gold plates, but this is the one that we're going to be um, engaging with. And so we have to start with basic questions and each of the dots along this line represent one of the questions below it. And the green ones are, are questions where we can continue to confirm. And the red ones are questions where we can't confirm. And remember, we're not allowed to use faith in any of this confirmation. So we start with the first question, does the Book of Mormon actually contain the claim that it was written on gold plates in an Egyptian writing system and language spoken by ancient Jewish people. And this one we can confirm. Yes, Jacob 4.1 mentions the plates. Moroni 9.32 mentions the reformed Egyptian. And 1 Nephi 1 through 2 states that the record is written using the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. So we got our, we got our line a little bit moving towards confirmation. So our second claim does the Anton transcription exist and is it alleged to be a transcription of glyphs from the gold plates? So we can confirm this one too. Yes, the document is extant. It's well attested. It's owned by the LDS church and it's part of a co collection used to compile the Joseph Smith papers um, where an image is available for inspection. It's a really nice high resolution image and that's the that's the address below there. That's kind of small. Sorry about that. So our second, our second question is fine. So now is where we start to have some problems. So do the transcribed characters accurately reflect the characters inscribed on the gold plates? And we don't know. The gold plates are not available for inspection. So this might seem trivial but it's really not. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that does make sense. And I can clearly see how that line could just continue. If you believed and had a belief in faith, you would simply just continue that line to the next dot. But you're right. You're halting it right there with your criteria. Yeah. So if we don't use faith, this really is the end of the line. 
-hmm. don't even have to go to four, five, and six or any other questions because we simply can't know that there is a text from which these were transcribed, right? So with the Abraham um, facsimiles, we do have an ancient sample from which those facsimiles were taken that we can compare them to in some of the cases. Um, we don't have that for the gold plates. So right here, th this is where we could just end the line, but we're gonna, we're gonna ask a few more questions to try to, to, try to be thorough. Um, we also don't know, for example, when, so if these were people that were very familiar with Egyptian, with any particular form of Egyptian, they might not have difficulty um, looking at, at glyphs on gold plates and transcribing them correctly. But if they were unfamiliar with Egyptian, which is likely, even if they were looking at some actual Egypt, Egyptian script on an actual text that's written on gold plates, they might have some difficulty transcribing those correctly. If they're not an artist, they might be um, making some generalizations or missing important parts of glyphs or any number of things. So we don't have we don't have a way of knowing, and that's that's a very important point. So had he done a rubbing, uh, you know, it's engraved and he rubbed it and it was an impression that still wouldn't tell us that they came from gold plates, but we could be more confident in at least the accuracy of them because it would be a direct copy as opposed to somebody handwriting them or trying to copy them that's not familiar with them. Exactly. And that's an excellent comparison. And you can also see that whoever wrote them, it's alleged to be Joseph Smith, but whoever wrote them was someone familiar with using um, a steel tip copper plate nib and ink and we're familiar with um, cursive scripts that you write with such a pen and so they have they have almost a cursive look to them that's the the strokes and the shapes and so forth are very reminiscent of cursive forms of Joseph Smith's time so that's not proof that they didn't come from gold plates, but it's also not proof that they did. There's many uh, possibilities for how that transcription could be wrong just based on the way it was copied. And I will say, you've probably seen this before. There's a document floating out there where they've taken the Anton characters. They've kind of turned them sideways up and down and, and you can read them as if it were English. You can, they really almost seem like you said, the same strokes the same curves, just maybe tipped on their side or upside down. So I'll see if I can find that and put that in the show notes because it's a really interesting document where someone has taken those characters written by supposedly Joseph Smith, tipped them on their side, and it really is English. You can read it. At least your, yeah, your mind I have, goes I there. actually have a slide I'll show you in just a minute that, oh, good. that sort of demonstrates that. Oh, good. Bit. Okay. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Boy, this is a great way so, to determine something. Yeah, so let's go. let's go to our fourth our fourth question, is it reasonable to assume that the characters are consistent with known Egyptian writing systems? No, the characters are not consistent with Egyptian hieroglyphics, hieratic, or demotic. And those are the systems that we know of. So um, I want to show some of the other images here to kind of make this point and to kind of demonstrate um, what you were just talking about, Rebecca. So. Um, if you could show the um, the image called Anton versus Hieratic. Okay, Anton versus Hieratic. <laughs> um, yeah, usually we have a share screen kind of thing we do here on Mormonish, but for some reason there's a ghost in the machine today. So Landon is going to be pulling up all of Trent's documents, and I think it'll work just fine. Oh, here we go. Look at this. So here we have... Um, a top bottom comparison and the source of the um, hieratic is below. And when you compare these glyphs, there's a few interesting things to pay attention to. So one is that um, it's hard to tell in the Anton sample, which direction the writing is going. If you, if you look at the uh, margins on the left and the right, 
they're not very even on either side. So it sort of looks like these characters are flowing from left to right, just like in English. And if that's the case, that's already unusual because um, most um, most languages in in the, in the category of um, ancient Egyptian and Hebrew and Aramaic, they actually go from right to left. So you'd expect to see um, the right hand margin lining up and the left hand margin being uneven. Does that yeah, make you, sense so yeah, far? Yeah, you can see here there's space. Uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but there's space there on the what fourth line down between that and the edge of the page. Yet the left hand seems to be lined up fairly well, which mm -hmm. would indicate you're writing left to right. Yes. Um, you can also see that when we're looking at the, the Egyptian text, um, you can see some things that look um, structurally similar in terms of shapes, but there's a lot of things that are not similar at all. So for example, um, in the Anton transcript, you can see several places where you have kind of these um, tick marks some of them have a line underneath them. Some of them have sort of a boat shape. Um, two of the boat shapes also have little dots underneath the score marks, almost like exclamation points. But one of the boats doesn't. And when you look at the um, Egyptian sample below, you can kind of see some places where there's like little dots that are sequenced. They're not really lines, but they're dots. So that's kind of the same. You can see some shapes that are the same. So in the second line of Egyptian text towards its end at the left side, there's there's a character that looks sort of like a three. Yep. And up in the Anton transcript, you can see some shapes that look kind of like a three. Um, but there's a whole a whole bunch of shapes that make no sense. And this is especially true when you actually look at just a set, when you look at just the set of glyphs that hieratic contains, and you try to just match them to the glyphs in the um, Anton transcription, you can you can pretty clearly see they're, they're not matching up. The other problem that we have here is the text at the bottom is actually a line, you know, it's a few lines of writing. Do we know for sure that whoever copied the characters onto the um, Anton transcription, that this was a, a bunch of continuous text or was it just a line from here and there and another line from elsewhere or just here's a glyph and there's a glyph and I'm just gonna sequence them into this um, paper so that it looks like a sample. We really don't know what's written here. We don't know if it's supposed to be an inventory of glyphs we don't know if it's a continuous text. We don't know the direction that it flows. And again, that's because we don't have an original text to compare it to. Hmm. So we can compare this to the other two forms of known Egyptian writing. So can if we you read show... the quote? Can we read what the the actual Egyptian writing says? I love that. Landon, you want to read it? You can see it better than I yeah. can. It says a uh, heretic excerpt from the instructions, instructions of Ammon Amun Amhat, dated to the 18th dynasty reign of Amenhotep the uh, first, which is 1514 to 1493 BC. Mm -hmm. It reads, "Be on your guard against all who are subordinate to you. Trust no brother, know no friend, make no intimates." Hmm. Very hmm. wise advice, isn't it? <laughs> so I guess I never really thought Sounds about like a the fortune characters. cookie. Yeah, it does sound like a fortune cookie. <laughs> Egyptian fortune cookies. <laughs> I never thought about that in terms of the characters document. Like you're right. What did they just pick things out here and there to give an example to take to an Egyptologist? Did they actually quote, you know, character for character from a certain segment? We don't really know, do we, exactly what we this don't. is? We have no idea. I've never thought of that before. <laughs> yeah, we really don't know what it what it is. We know they did this to take it to someone to try to to try right. to get them to to confirm it, but we don't know what they took from the right. plates allegedly huh, right never thought about that 
So let's let's go through a couple more really quick comparisons. Um, so if you could show the um, Anton versus hieroglyphs. Oh yeah, those are oh, not at all the same. <laughs> yeah, look at that. No. So both both hieroglyphs and hieratic were used almost for the same time period at the same amount of time. And in terms of attested samples, we kind of have the same um, range of time. Um, hieroglyphics was, was much more difficult to write and that's why hieratic developed. It's kind of a cursive form that's easier to do, right? But you can look at this and even someone with no linguistics training can say, there's a lot of reasons why these do not look like the same thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, hieroglyphs can be written horizontally and they can be written in multiple directions. But again, we're not seeing a glyph inventory that accounts for the characters in the Anton sample at all. So the um, hieratic and um, hieroglyphics are the oldest written forms of, of Egyptian. So let's do the last Egyptian one, which is the demotic. Yeah, and you, uh, I guess uh, I was able to take in a trip to Egypt, and and I guess I didn't realize that there were really three different languages that the uh, that the Egyptians uh, speak. Um, and you're looking for demotic, right? Yeah, let's do demotic and just to show. Uh, okay, side by side. And so the so three here were, again. The, the three the three Egyptian forms were. Uh, Again, then demotic, erratic, and hieroglyphic is is that yeah. Correct? So hier hieroglyphic and hieratic are the earliest forms, and demotic came later. It's it's further um, simplified and made more cursive. And, and the other thing, a lot did of did it don't exist understand. in six hundred BC? Demotic how how late did it come in? Um, I have a slide that that shows that shows. Um, the time periods of all these different writing systems, which I can okay. show in just a minute. Perfect. But um, again, you can see, yes, there are some shapes that have some cosmetic similarity, but when, you know, demotic is a well-known form. We have, we have the full inventory of glyphs and you cannot account for the characters in the Anton transcript from the inventory of demotic glyphs. They're just not demotic. And, and so you, you can you, say some of the squiggles re resemble squiggles in demotic, right. but you can't say all the squiggles do. So we have these three forms of Egyptian that are the known forms and they do not match a text that is supposed to have been written in some kind of Egyptian writing from around you know 600 and after. So now let's do the one that, that will, um, demonstrate something that I think is very important. If you could do the Anton versus Latin. Ooh, and did you have a question, Landon, before that on that last one? Or a um, comment? Uh, I, I was just gonna say that just, even if you were to find two or three characters that look dissimilar, cause you only can make so many, you know, in just about yeah. any language, you can find a couple characters that yeah. might look similar to each other. That doesn't make a language. I can't. I can't no. write language out of three letters that that look alike and make and write in that language that somebody else could understand. So, uh, I guess that was kind of the point: is you can't just make a claim. Oh, these look kind of similar, you know. <laughs> so, I couldn't. I've seen this many times, and I I was able to find this easily online, and I can't remember who put this together. It, I couldn't find a reference to who put this together anywhere yeah. online. But this this demonstrates two important things. One, these glyphs look an awful lot like um, <laughs> Roman handwritten script from Joseph yeah. Smith's time, both print and cursive. So if we're going to be saying that um, glyph similarity is enough to establish a link between one writing system and another, then we're going to declare this as English text written in the mm -hmm. Roman alphabet. Yeah. Because we have just as much credence to say that with this kind of comparison as we do to say it's Egyptian. 
probably more because I can actually yeah. see these actually match see up. It. You can every letter in the alphabet is there where we don't have every letter of the other languages represented. The other important thing that this shows, which is super important that people understand this, this is something that LDS apologists never talk about. So let's pretend for just a moment that it is that it is um, legitimate to say if the glyphs look similar to glyphs in a known language or writing system, then they are that known language or writing system. Here's where it breaks down. So let's pretend we know that this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, so forth. Now, when we look at the document, what meaning can we get out of it? If we, if we actually start spelling things with these glyphs, it's gibberish, yeah. right? And even though we've got these ones that match A, B, C, D, E, F, G, there's a whole bunch in there that don't match anything. Or we might have two that look like H. So the first two glyphs both look kind of like H's, right? Yeah. So which one of those is actually H? It's just not a legitimate way to determine a writing system. A so writing system that, has to have a system behind it that gets explained yeah. by the correspondences. So Does you're that saying that sense? even in the other documents, um, the other Egyptian documents, just the fact that you can cherry pick a few little things out of it, that's not a writing system at all. No, it's gibberish at once all. you put it together. And it's interesting because my parents really were into reformed Egyptian. They were back in the farms days, you know, and that was huge. They have so many books on it. They thought that they had taught themselves to read and write reformed Egyptian, which is, uh, that's a whole other <laughs> issue. But, you know, I think their take on it was sort of that reformed was so removed from actual Egyptian, you know, it was just so different. Um, that's why it didn't, there wasn't really any way to compare, but that, that, I mean, if you were reading something called reformed English, you would definitely see the marks of English in it. You, something reformed means it harkens back to, I mean, on a very simplistic level, I think. So this idea that maybe you could apologize it away by saying, oh, reformed Egyptian, you wouldn't expect it to look like any of those other Egyptian writings. Well, yes, you would. <laughs> it would be a shorthand or a cursive or something. You would find the remnants of it in reformed. That That's true. And you would also expect to find um, sample. So Lehi came from the area where Jerusalem is. And he left around 600 BCE. Well, you'd expect if, if this is a major form of Egyptian, you'd expect to see it attested there, yeah. right? At that time and in that place. Yeah. We don't, we don't see anything like it attested there. Yeah. So there even is, there is, there's a document I know of, um, and I had some fun um, emailing with a professor that translated it, but it's actually um, the Aramaic language, but the document is written in Demotic script. So, that's a pretty weird and rare thing to happen because people don't understand that that a writing system and a language are two distinct things. For example, um, I can use the Cyrillic alphabet that's used in many of, like in Russian and many other languages, um, to write English. Right? I can I can mangle that alphabet and write English in that alphabet. That doesn't mean I'm writing Russian. So someone would, mm. would look at that and they might assume it's Russian, right? but it's English because I'm just using the Cyrillic alphabet to write English. So even though we have an attested document written in Aramaic, which, which was the language of the place where Lehi allegedly came from, but it's written in the Demotic writing system, that can, that can show that yes, that kind of looks like the language of the Jews written in the writing of the Egyptians, but that's Demotic. That's not this this stuff, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, that clearly matches demonic, and it has a system behind it that that you can actually read the text and, and understand what the text is saying, even though it's Aramaic. This doesn't. This is nothing like demonic, and there's nothing attested in that area and during that time period that looks anything like this. And it would have had to been wide scale known if if a Hebrew guy from Jerusalem is writing in reformed Egyptian. I mean, that's not even his native language. It's not his native country. 
So if reformed Egyptian had traveled far enough that it's in another country used by uh, another set of people for communication, it would have had to been widely known uh, in order for that to be used. Yeah, you, at least it's likely that that would be the case. I mean, there are there are really weird anomalies that can happen, but it's not very likely. Um, and let me show you one other thing. If you wouldn't mind, um, this slide's actually for, for something different, but it'll work to help demonstrate something here real quick. If you could go to the one that says times, languages, places. Okay. And yeah, I apologize I I for can... making you do my Oh, no, this is totally fine. No, 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 we get it. We And we're, we're just, this is so, so interesting. I was thinking of, remember that Book of Mormon? Maybe we're all old enough to remember back in the, I think it was the 80s, the gold Book of Mormon, where it had those characters on the oh, yeah. cover. And oh my gosh, I remember just sitting there at church because there was nothing else going on. I didn't want to listen to the speaker, <laughs> just pouring over that, trying to figure out what it was and kind of getting goosebumps that, you know, it, it was from such a, a long time ago. And, you know, there's this romanticism around reformed Egyptian. I think that's why my parents were so, you know, I mean, they were both scientists themselves, which is crazy to think how they kind of fell for that. But I remember being really intrigued and just thinking, this is amazing. This is goosebumps that, that this is real. And that golden Book of Mormon cover, you know, really brought that home, I think. So this slide um, is for a different purpose, and I apologize for how crammed it is with things, but what this basically shows is the time periods that span um, our earliest um, extant samples and our to our latest extant samples of writing systems. And so we've overlaid that, this gray, sort of like gray um, vertical stripe in the middle, that's that's the time span from when Lehi left Jerusalem until the end of the Book of Mormon, right? Now, just look at um, Sumerian, hieroglyphic, and hieratic, right? They span thousands of years, and even as the languages changed, the forms of writing did not change dramatically, right? Now look at that tiny time span from when Lehi left Jerusalem until the end of the Book of Mormon. And in all likelihood, we're talking about an even shorter time span, span than that, that the golden plates would have been uh, made during. Why would the glyphs change so drastically if they came from hieroglyphic, hieratic, or even demotic that you can see spans almost the same period there? Um, that kind of change has to be done intentionally, and it's not very normal. It takes weird people like me and my conlanging friends to do that. And especially if your goal is to make a record that's going to preserve your history and preserve important information from God, why would you want to obfuscate that by trying to change the writing system in such a way that someone couldn't understand it? You'd want to be very careful to make sure it was clear and written well. It simply doesn't make sense to say that the language just changed because, you know, they left the old world and it just naturally changed like languages do. Those kind of changes to happen naturally take a very long time. Um, so the, argu the argument that uh, only uh, the upper class was writing this and yeah. knew this, that would make it change even slower because you're having fewer people using it and they're using it only in a professional uh, manner, professional category. So you don't get the slang and the new technology and the other words getting introduced into it because that would be in, in whatever language they're speaking uh, and not in this reformed Egyptian. That would change very slowly, if, if at all, when you're passing it on from just one person, few people to the next. Well, and keep in mind, so, so think about English. Um, the English language um, changes on a regular basis. We, we have new slang, new, new technical terms all the time. The writing system does not. Hmm. The writing system can still represent those linguistic changes without changing. So writing systems change very slowly. There are exceptions to that. There are times in history where a culture has borrowed glyphs from another culture because they recognize them as a technology 
and and as something that will um, give them better literacy. But once a writing system has been adopted by a group of people, it's not normal for it to change that quickly. Language itself, the structure of a language, the words and lexicon of a language, even the grammar will change and the writing system will just keep moving right along with it without changing very much. Hmm. Um, so it's not, when you look at these time spans that we're talking about, it's not very realistic to say that the, the form of Egyptian they were using was hieroglyphic, hieratic, or demotic, and it just changed so drastically because it was such a long time that they used it. It, it wasn't a long time. Yeah, I've never thought um, of that. I, boy, you're just blowing my mind here because you're right. We can read the Joseph Smith papers. I mean, we can read that. And that was, you know, 150 years ago. We can read old English, right? I mean, it might be a little hard, but we can we can read it. That was centuries ago. Yeah. So that the, is letters, so, the letters, the letters of letters. old English yeah. are available to us, even though uh -huh. they have, you know, they got Thorn and a couple of other ones we don't use anymore. Right. You can learn that in two minutes and you can uh -huh. already, you know, you can pronounce it without knowing anything yep. about the language, right? Yep. Because yeah. the writing systems don't change that quickly. They don't change. The linguistics change, but the writing system doesn't. <laughs> now, one, okay. one, I'm not sure one, if we got all the way done with the claim. Do we want to go back to that? Oh, we could. What was your comment, Landon, about the writing I, I was going to say the one thing I don't see on here is uh, the Jaredites would have been uh, like, weren't they like 3400 BC? So they they would have only had Sumerian uh, of course, they want to claim it's pure Adamic language. Yeah. And so you've got a completely different language that then is read through uh, some interpreter and interpreted into a reformed Egyptian language that is then passed on. But we have in, in both cases, we have uh, language being completely changed and completely altered over a, a, a very short period of time. And it doesn't and let's not forget <laughs> the Book of Mormon itself. The reason it's called the Book of Mormon is because Mormon, who was a descendant of Lehi, so he'd have had Lehi's linguistic heritage, he abridged with, with the Urim and Thummim or whatever divine manner of translation um, the Book of Mormon claims, he abridged all those records into a single record that became the Book of Mormon, right? So um, yes, the Jaredites, they predated, but that's still the Jaredites don't give us an explanation for the gold plate text mm -hmm. and its its writing system. And we would have absolutely no clue um, what a Jaredite would be speaking or writing in. We yeah. we just we we have nothing, nothing extant that would give us any idea about that. <laughs> That's true. So I think, yeah, let's go back to that claim just so we can finish it out and you can show us, you know. How then we end up not connecting the dots and then we can move on to the next one. This is such a really interesting way to just very methodically and logically go through some of these ideas. I, I mean, you can use this technique on any claim. This is, this is really interesting. Okay. So I think that was number four. To, we were saying, no, it's not reasonable. And number five, no, we don't have old word, old world samples that match okay. um, the Anton glyphs. So number six, is it reasonable to conclude that similar glyphs in Egyptian or other writing systems establish a link between those writing systems and the glyphs in the Anton transcription? The answer to that is no. You need a large sample and you need systemic correspondence in order to rule out mere coincidence. And I wanna, I wanna show one more slide to demonstrate this and then we'll be done with this claim. So if you could show the slide that says cosmetic similarity So this is actually just a very rudimentary, very cursory look at some, some glyphs on the left and how many different writing systems use that glyph hmm. for different things, okay? So just saying this squiggle looks like that squiggle isn't enough. That's only enough to kind of point you in a direction where you say, yeah, let's explore this and see if there's a system behind it that justifies saying that they're the same. But what you really need is a large enough sample of your A and your B 
that you can also see the same system operating behind the similarities, right? So you're going to start looking for sequences that match, for structures that match, um, not just for a correspondence between a few forms here and there. Um, the one on this that's the most interesting to me is the circle with the dot in the middle. Um, I could have added probably three times as many correspondences for that one as I have here. That's a super common one. And there's also something, um, there, there's a kind of um, equilibrium or homeostasis in linguistics that comes from the, the structure and limitations of our human brains. So we want our writing systems, for example, to have enough, to, for the shapes and so forth, to have enough complexity that we can distinguish them from one another, but they need to have enough simplicity that it's not impossible to remember. So with an alphabet, which most of these are um, present in alphabets, but not all, some of them are in um, logographic systems too. The, the squiggles are not going to be very complex because I only need, you know, between 24 and 60 on the outside edge symbols to represent all the sounds in my language, all the, all the phonemes in my language. And so I don't need to make them really complicated in order to tell them apart. You know, I can, I can have one that's a line horizontal, one that's a vertical line. I could have a diagonal line and those could all be distinct and it's just a simple line, right? Yeah. I, I could have a, a circle. Circle is a very common shape. I can have a horseshoe shape in different orientations. So that means that a lot of alphabets are going to share similar looking squiggles because you don't need really complicated squiggles to represent between 20 and 60 different things, right? Now, when we think of logographic systems where you have one symbol to one word, that gets a lot more complicated, mm -hmm. right? I need yeah. a lot more strokes and lines and a lot more variation. And I might even need something that's kind of mnemonic in my glyph in order to distinguish, but also to easily remember them. So those are going to be a lot more complicated. Because um, you're going to have hundreds of characters that you're going to have to because each one represents a word yeah it's more like thousands thousands, thousands yeah. okay yeah well so, and then we're like, told in the book of mormon that you know one tiny little you know drawing a horseshoe represents paragraphs of <laughs> paragraphs yes that's of a really good point so let's <laughs> let's just explore that for one second so if the horseshoe so i mean it's even more ridiculous than that because there's there's ones where there's a line and there's one where there's a line with a dot right? Yeah. And then there's, there's a bigger line, you know, the difference between a horizontal line and a bigger horizontal line are, it's so subtle, you could easily get that wrong. And then mm -hmm. how, how do I easily encode and remember that the small horizontal line represents this whole paragraph of meaning, but the larger horizontal line represents this other whole paragraph of meaning. That simply is not the way um, the homeostatic boundaries and the equilibrium in our human brain work. We don't, that, that would be, that would be a much bigger brained creature that would, that would be able to handle something like that, where one millimeter of difference in a single stroke means it's a whole different token with a whole different explanation behind it. We don't discriminate at that level as human beings. So yeah, the Egyptian grammar is, there's a lot of interesting things about that that we can talk about, but um, this slide just basically shows how those, those cosmetic similarities are not enough. You also have to have things lining up with timeframes and locations and with the types of writing systems. So if I'm gonna compare one sample to another and I'm trying to establish that they're the same, I can't have one that's an alphabet and the other one that's a syllabary. Mm. You guys know what a syllabary is? That's where each glyph represents a whole mm. syllable, okay. right? 
Right. I think we covered, I think we did an episode, one of our episodes with yeah. Dr. John Lundwell talked about that a little bit, how not just a sound, but a syllable. So you'd string them together to give you the syllables of the word. Like and that's Mormon because- could be done by two characters rather right. than Mormon. six yeah. Um, characters. Right. Yeah, so you can see how that would not correspond, right? right. Yeah. Huh. And it would be even worse if you have a logographic script because then you're trying to compare squiggles that represent phonemes with complicated squiggles that represent words, whole words and concepts. So you also have to have them, you have to have the type of writing system lining up. You have to have the cosmetic correspondences lining up. You have to have the time periods lining up. And you have to have the structure behind both A and B lining up so that you can prove this structure over here in in B is identical to the structure over here in A, and it allows me to read both A and B. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. And understand the meaning that's in A and B. Yeah, and these are things we just don't think about, right? Nobody does. You're just like, oh, look. How fun. Squiggles on gold must be true. <laughs> well, and it, It's a good point. If I were to ask 10 people and I put them in a room and I said, I need you to make 30 characters yeah. um, that are simple characters. Um, and, and that's all I want. 30 different characters. With those 10 people, multiple of those are going to have something yeah. that looks very similar because there's only so many simple shapes that yep. you make. Um, that people can draw. And you're going to get a lot of lines, a lot of dots, a lot of circles, a lot of squares, because that's what people do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So for me, these were the kinds of things that make it impossible for me to say, yes, the the glyphs in the um, Anton transcription um, are glyphs uh, that represent some form of ancient Egyptian writing or language. Well, writing and or language, it could be either one. Um, And that they are from the gold plates that Joseph Smith claimed um, to have translated. I I simply can't, if I I exclude faith, I simply cannot say, yes, I I can have confidence in that claim. Quite the contrary, I have to say, I, I don't really see how I can have any confidence in that claim. It doesn't mean I'm saying I know for sure it isn't true or it can't be true, but I'm saying there's a lot of reasons why I have very little confidence that it's true. Hmm. Yeah. So if we were go back to go back to the other slide, I don't know if we need to, but the dots don't connect. There's the confirmed claim. And you've kind of shown in your mind for you, that's not confirmed. That isn't an accurate claim in your mind by your criteria. Well, I think by any scientific yeah, criteria, right. I don't think there's a scientist <laughs> in the world who, you, given that information, would would make a claim that this is a yep. known or an actual uh, uh, language or that it comes from any known or actual language um, from the evidence that is there, in which case you only can go on faith, which, you know, apologetics and, and believing members will say, well, it's a spiritual book, it's based on faith. Uh, therefore, that uh, I'm okay only having faith on, in that. But, you know, you've written Romulan. There's a language in Romulan. I can have faith then that because there's a Romulan a, uh, language that there's actual Romulans. But that hey, doesn't make it, it so. <laughs> just because I just because I want to have the faith, it doesn't make it so. Um, and so y- you can't just make this giant leap. Or if you are, then someone who has faith in Romulan has just as legitimate a claim to uh, God, to, to some sort of spiritualism as a person that's belie- that, that believes in the Book of Mormon being a spiritual book. And you can draw it if you'd like, you can find spirituality in it, but it doesn't make it his- historical. Right. And, and these, um, these kinds of um, problems in LDS canon and, and claims did something very specific to my faith. And I want to I spend some time 
on that, maybe 10 minutes. So I don't know if you want to do that now or if you want to yeah. do a different claim yeah. and then do go that ahead. afterward. No, I think this fits in really well right here. And then I think I'd love to go for our next claim, maybe to talk about, you know, some of the writer researchers in the, in the, you know, apologetic world who, who do follow the dots and come to a different conclusion. I think you have some information on that. So yeah, let's do it. You want to do the next claim or you want to do... No, um, you can talk about your faith and then let's go to... Okay, the, so yeah. can you show the, the slide called Faith in Me? <laughs> Not Faith in Me, Faith and Me. <laughs> and Me, there you go. <laughs> so um, as I started to encounter things like this and I realized that I was connecting the dots using faith, not using... Um, I wasn't always just going straight from one to the other with faith, but I was kind of, I was kind of seeing um, the faith justifies the connection. And then these other dots that, that also are true mean my faith is well-founded. Right. But what I realized for myself was that there's something a lot more um, global happening there. It's not just limited to the faith claims of the church. It's not just limited to the faith claims of Christianity or religion. It's kind of a it's kind of a structure that just exists in the human condition, and it can be very problematic. At least I I consider it to be problematic. So if you look at this simple diagram, at the bottom there's there's a single point, and that's that's faith. So what I mean by faith is anytime. Um, we use um, a grounds of justification that's arbitrary for determining that something is true or real. We simply just choose to believe that it's true or real for whatever reason, okay? That would be faith. A faith belief is a belief we have that's justified by that. So to distinguish between a belief that would be justified by faith and one that isn't in the way I'm using it. Um, I can believe that the world is flat, right? And I can justify that because I trust the person who told me or because it just feels right to me or because I believe I had this epiphany moment where I, where I looked out over the horizon and I just had this, this feeling of, grandeur and this kind of supernal feeling that to me meant, yes, I, this is true. It's flat, right? Those kind, those kinds of justifications for the belief don't have anything to do with something that I can demonstrate to someone else. And regardless of what they believe, it would show them that they can have confidence in that, in that um, claim that it's flat. They would have to be like me. They'd, they, would, they would have to just accept it because I told them or they would have to try to have their own experience of grandeur and awe that, that they interpret as truth, you know. But I, I can't really just demonstrate something to them regardless of what they believe that gives them confidence in the claim. If I say I don't think the earth is flat and I do some experiments that show how the earth is not flat, so a really, a really fun one that I, I did with my um, children not too long ago, we, we went on a cruise to Mexico or out on the ocean. So you can see, you know, you can see the curvature of the earth out there. And I said, let's, let's look at the ocean with this meter stick and see if we can get the meter stick to touch on both sides without some of the curve either popping above it, or if we do it above the horizon line without there being gaps below it, right? Super simple experiment. You can't do that. You can't, you can't get a straight line. So that at least tells us that something's causing the ocean to, to be in a rounded shape, right? But there's, there's more experiments you can do that are even simpler where it doesn't matter what anyone believes you can demonstrate that to them. And they can't deny that there are gaps on the side or that you have a bubble over the top of the, of the meter stick. They can't deny that. They might be able to, to say, well, I'm gonna use some other faith-based justification to still make that work. 
for, for me and my system, but they can't deny what they're seeing, right? It doesn't matter what they believe, they can't deny what they're seeing. So that's the distinction between a faith belief and a belief that's justified with something objective or empirical. When we have a faith belief, we're going to um, also have an accompanying faith system or faith behavior that we execute based on that belief. And this is where I realized that faith fit was failing for me. So um, it's true that if I believe on faith, so like if we look at these um, paragraphs on the right side, um, I have faith that the Holy Ghost exists and is what the LDS canon defines it to be. So that's, that's, the, that's the faith right there. Because of my faith, I felt the things that the canon stipulates as the Holy Ghost confirming the truth of my belief. So I've taken the faith and I formed a faith belief by assigning truth or reality to something just because of a feeling that I'm told is the Holy Ghost. So I believe that a feeling I have means something is true or real. Under the canon, the authority of prophets and the revelation given to them is equivalent to the authority and will of a perfect, omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent God. Um, it's always true. It trumps personal revelation and it must be obeyed. So that's the structure it took specifically for me. Why, why did I see that as a problem? Well, this structure of belief is fine if by luck the prophet and the canon and the omnibenevolent God are telling me feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, all those things, right? Because that won't do any harm to anybody. But what happens when they start telling me stone a person to death if they pick up a stick on Sunday? Abandon your family if they don't believe the same things. Um, in other religions, it could be something like um, we're, we're the ones that have a right to inherit the earth. Everyone else doesn't. And God wants us to fight. Right. And that could be interpreted in any number of ways. This kind of faith doesn't just exist in religion either. So you can see this in politics. You can see it in corporate culture. You can see it in the various cultures of the world where we have these beliefs that are based on faith, not religious faith, but the same structure. A kind of trust that isn't backed up by anything that we can demonstrate, regardless of what we believe. That means that that black box can also very easily explain why we have Chad and Tammy Daybell and, and everything that went along with them. Why we have the Lafferty's, why we have Jonestown, why we have Adolf Hitler and people who willingly followed him. Yeah, I was going to. It's gonna, this I was mechanism. Gonna, yeah. It's this I, I, mechanism that allows yeah. that. Yeah. I was going to say Japan, uh, they, they followed the emperor as a god, and mm -hmm. uh, they were willing to die for him, and we saw that in World War II. You know, it was a faith in a system and an emperor, uh, and they followed it to their detriment. So, Yeah, so so faith, faith kind of becomes um, the last venerated um, confirmation bias that the human family still cherishes and treats like high virtue. And um, it took me a long time to personally, and, and I'm, I'm just talking about me personally, but it took me a long time to, to understand how dangerous that actually is and that it's not a virtue. It's not venerable. For me, it actually amounted to a form of slavery, a kind of psychological slavery um, and a subjugating of my own identity and will. And you can see very easily how that can happen in this kind of a structure. The other thing that this showed me is how flimsy 
this is as a form of justification because mm -hmm. as soon as I discover that either my faith belief um, is failing me, everything above it collapses, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, my belief in the whole canon of the LDS church collapsed when my testimony collapsed. And if you get to the point where you deconstruct it down to faith itself and faith collapses, then everything that you've accepted on faith, all your faith beliefs collapse. And in a case like mine, where that was all I had, that leaves you with nothing. That it's, it's like starting over from infancy in terms of deciding what's real, what's moral, what's ethical, what does love mean? What does kindness mean? What's right? What's wrong? It, it basically strips you of everything and leaves you with nothing. It's like, I mentioned this before, I think to, uh, to you two, but it's like, um, you have, you have this structure that needs bearing up and you've had a soap bubble that's been holding it up and, and being inflated and grown until it's so thin that it pops. And then you just have nothing holding that structure. And you're, you're left with this empty sort of nihilistic state. And I don't think nihilism is a philosophy that people turn to. Nihilism is a symptom that comes when a poorly founded system of belief and behavior collapses. And that's why for me, these kinds of things um, show the importance of not relying on faith, not filling those gaps with faith and faith beliefs and faith systems, but actually letting myself be comfortable with not knowing or with knowing that it's not what I expect or want rather than just continuing to believe in something because of faith, because when that collapses, it's, it can cause major calamity for people. Uh, it really did in my life and a lot of others. I, I paid a high price for that bubble popping. <laughs> now, this is an excellent diagram. I don't you think, Lennon, this really illustrates, I think, what we see over and over in so many different ways. And I, I have to make the comparison, since we're talking about evidence of things, to Book of Mormon Central and their new series, A Marvelous Work, The, the Strength of the Evidence, because they do try to, to show some evidences. But inevitably, in all the episode, the final scene is always, but what it really boils down to is how you feel and your faith. And then they'll have some kind of segment about someone who just simply believes in the Book of Mormon because they have faith in it. So I think even they recognize these evidences, as they always say in quotes like that. It's just faith. That's really all you have. And this diagram I think shows how so many people we know just collapse completely. And so immediately, which we're all trying to figure out, why did this happen? Why do I feel this way? I think this is a really important diagram. You've really showed it. What do you think, Landon? Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree. That's exactly what happens to people. And that I think that's why you see so many uh, LDS people who lose their faith going uh, instantly almost to atheism because mm -hmm. everything they believed was tied up in this faith system. And so when uh, when it collapses, it just collapses to nothing because you can't you now can't rely on anything. I was relying on the Holy Ghost. I was relying on God, and I, and that misled me. So why would I put any faith or any reliability or any belief into uh, into these beings that let me down uh, that I built my entire faith structure on? And so I I agree. It goes exactly to that. You you uh, just go to nothing, and you you start over again, saying now why do I really believe this? that you know do do i believe in just say the word of wisdom do i believe in not drinking now uh, and and now i have to figure out maybe i take some drinks and figure out no i think this is okay or you say no i don't like this but you have to start all over from scratch uh and and retest your whole uh belief system it has to be retested and rediscovered i agree 100 percent. yeah this is great I think we're going to have to borrow this slide from you and put this out because I think this really...
helps people kind of understand what happened to me. Why? You know, this is it when it's that negative faith right there. And that's what they promote. It's all about faith. It doesn't matter. Don't research is not the answer. Don't look for answers. Trust your feelings. Trust Moroni's promise. Trust your faith. That's what gives you that little faith dot right there. Research yeah, none of I, it is important. I, I think it's really important too. This this slide has other meaning for me. When I think back to when I was a very devout believer, part of the reason why I so quickly rejected challenges to the church or to certain beliefs or especially to faith is because you can see as the challenge gets closer and closer to the base of this thing, you're talking about shaking and collapsing my entire worldview, right? Nobody likes to look at the existential abyss. Nobody likes to think my whole worldview is wrong, right? And the closer a question or a challenge would get to the bottom of that, the more I would feel that, that dread and that fear of my whole worldview, you know, all these beautiful things, all this guaranteed safety, all this privilege, all, all of these promises of blessings and of a safe, um, predictable life and of eternity with my family and all these, all these amazing possibilities, even though they never tell you anything about what they really are, about the next life. <laughs> um, nobody wants that all taken away. Nobody wants that ripped out from under them it scares you. It feels horrible. Right. And that's another way that this, this kind of structure for a, for a way of believing and a way of building a worldview and a way of behaving is such a disservice to people because not only does it fail eventually, especially if you don't have a, a, a very um, smooth privileged path through it, but every time something challenges it, you want to just plug your ears and hum because you don't want all that beauty and, and promise and privilege and safety ripped away. Right. Of course you're going to plug your ears and hum and say, no, 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 uh, -uh. you know, you don't want to feel that. And this structure to me captures for, for me, at least why I had those feelings when I was a believer, whenever it was challenged and why I was so comfortable with the mandates from leadership saying, don't look at this, don't look at that, don't talk about this, don't talk about that, don't associate with this person, don't associate with this organization. I was comfortable because it didn't threaten the whole structure of promise that I had been given from birth. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to look at these evidences that you're showing and not just say, I rely on faith, because if you just rely on faith, which really has no foundation. Um, it, it's it's a belief, but uh, it's going it, it, it'll easily fall. Whereas evidence has a foundation, and evidence can be wrong, mm -hmm. but it typically is wrong to a degree, and it doesn't collapse an entire system. It's evidence is made up of a lot of pieces, so one piece might fail you, but the other pieces are still still in place, shoring you up. So. Yeah, and I think the focus on truth is actually a problem because I, I think a more healthy a more healthy structure for belief is one of confidence. So you say there's a lot of things that stack up to give me confidence in this. It it holds true multiple times. Um, I can see it. I can demonstrate it to other mm -hmm. people. That doesn't mean I'm saying. It's always going to be this way. I know it's always going to be this way. It always has been this way. It's, it's this immutable, solid thing that's always going to be there. It's just simply saying, I see a lot of stuff that gives me confidence in this. And I could see stuff later that doesn't give me confidence mm -hmm. in it. Or I could learn something that, that shows me that I actually have confidence in something that's a bigger structure than this. Not, it's not as small as this or whatever. You're open to the change, mm -hmm. the transmutation, truth truth can actually be kind of a detrimental way of looking at belief. <laughs> that is and, so true. And we hear pure truth all the time. That's the new phrase coming from upper leadership in the church, pure truth, but there's no such thing. I mean, we should all know that you have to change when, when faced with new evidence, you have to, you have to yeah. pivot. 
But you but don't if, if you just say, nope, I'm holding on to that original faith. That's just like Book of Mormon Central. They're like, yeah, this and that, but that, your original faith, that's all you need to remember. That's not how human beings should operate. <laughs> no. And if, if you're willing to conform to the evidence, recognizing that I know evidence may change and may change my mind, that's completely different than saying, I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. I know this is true. And as soon as... Because then, as soon as anything uh, affects that, the whole the whole thing collapses. Because you can't pivot, you can't change, you no. can't accept. You double it as, down. You, yeah, you have to double down, and 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 you get the cognitive dissonance that just yeah. uh, uh, destroys you. So. And then you're sometimes out of reality. I think so. Why don't we go to the other claim that we were going to look at? Because this fits right along with what we've been talking about. Um, that faith and evidence and so you're talking about the grover yeah let's go into yeah. that i think that's okay. really interesting that fits right in so which slide do we need to find um it's called claim grover translation in the grover translation okay perfect go cool. yeah because as we said there are a lot of people in book of mormon central scripture central um writer researchers who have you know put out extensive materials on what we're talking about, which are all skewed to help you keep that faith, even in the face I, of evidences that may not support that at all. Yeah, I want to I want to say something really quick here, too, before we go into this, just really fast. People, um, faithful people who, who do this kind of research, they're not stupid people and it's hard work. They're 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 looking for they're they're sifting through things. They're digging deep and stuff. The problem isn't the person. It's not that they're stupid. What what is problematic to me are the methodologies mm -hmm. that are accepted. Um, and again, when people have that inverted pyramid as the structure for their worldview, they're going to be susceptible to flawed methodologies because again, they don't want that taken away. They don't want all that promise and everything taken away. So I have respect for Jerry Grover and for the hard work that he has done here. But the methodologies here, which are separate and apart from Jerry Grover, I do not have respect for, and they need to be criticized. So I just wanted to make sure that distinction was clear before I start. No, I'm glad you did, because we talk about this all the time. And I always bring up my dad in his example, who's a doctorate level metallurgist, and he did not believe in evolution. He thought the world was 6,000 years old. He did not believe in carbon dating, doctorate level metallurgist. And the reason he did not believe in those things is simply because internally he's protecting his faith paradigm. He has to compartmentalize. He cannot go there. And I've talked to other scientists who have since, you know, stepped away from the church and they asked themselves the same question. How did I not see this? You've got to protect that paradigm or it all collapses. And I think we intuitively know that. And so you're right. These are not people that don't know what they're doing. These are very smart people. Yeah. And I, I, I have respect for the hard work and the, mm -hmm. and the dedication and mm -hmm. everything. They're, they're good people. Right. Yep. So Absolutely. the claim is, um, Jerry D. Grover Jr. wrote a paper in which he claims to have accurately translated the text of the Anton transcription. Okay, so we have the claim. We're going to try to work towards confirming it, and we're going to not allow faith to be the way we draw that line. So we start asking questions. Does the alleged paper exist? Is it written by Jerry D. Grover? And does it claim to be a translation of the Anton transcription? So yes, we can answer that affirmatively. It does exist, it bears his name. He has attested to it on video and its content claims to be a translation of the Anton transcription. Um, you can get a, a PDF of it at this um, address that I included there. And um, he's very um, forthright in laying out exactly what he did and, and I admire that. So we have our first green. So two, does the Anton transcription exist? And is it alleged to be um, taken from the gold plates? So we've already gone over this. Yes, the document is extant. It's well attested. It's owned by the LDS church. It's part of the Joseph Smith papers. And a high-res image is available at that um, URL that I provided that's super teeny. <laughs> <laughs> 
So now number three, we hit our first problem. Does Grover use accepted standard means of identifying and translating the Anton transcription? And we've talked a little bit about why those standards are so important and how they rule out mistaken um, assumptions. So no. In fact, on pages 14 and 15 of Grover's paper, he stipulates one, an insufficiently large sample of text, two, an inability to identify the specific language and writing system of the sample, three, a lack of parallel text in the second known language, and four, a lack of extant cultural context for the sample among other problems. So you have to admire him for stipulating these things hmm. in his paper. And how did he present that? Just by saying, all right, as means of disclaimer, I'm going to let you know this, this, this was, I haven't read the paper. So I think well, Brandon, you looked at it. So unfortunately, what he does is he cites, um, he, he's obviously read and he cites Ko, who's a Mayan epigrapher. Oh. And Ko, being a trained linguist, okay. stipulates these things as necessary for doing what Grover is trying to do. Okay. The problem is after he after he mentions his admiration for Ko and his admiration for these um, standards, he then says, "I I can't I can't meet those standards, so I'm going to use a different set of standards." <laughs> okay. And that leads us to number four. So do Grover's alternative methods sufficiently establish the language or writing system of the Anton transcription? So no, Grover does not identify a known language or known writing system to which the glyphs in the Anton transcription or alleged language of the transcription belong. Rather, Grover arbitrarily associates, associates, associates glyphs in the Anton sample with various glyphs in multiple samples from multiple languages, rendering only a meaning in English, but no grammatical or phonological information or systemics. And I'll demonstrate that in a minute with some other slides. Um, so you're saying that he's so, pulling from many different sources to put them together, synthesize through the English language, basically to create some kind of meaning. Yeah, so, so um, we could accept number three if number four could be answered yes, right? So uh -huh. we could accept that he's not using some standard things that are common to linguistics if he had come up with something himself that demonstrates it with the same degree of surety, right? But he doesn't do that. So... Um, I can't just point to cosmetic similarities in multiple mm -hmm. different languages and say, because this squiggle looks like this squiggle and because squiggle B means this, that means that squiggle A means that, uh, right? And that is the approach he takes. Okay. And that so makes a lot of go, sense given what you just told us in the first hour. Yeah. I understand that now. Yeah. Okay. So if you go back to that big complicated slide called times, languages, and places, And thanks again for, for doing my work for me. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a technical glitch, but we're going to work around it because this is important. <laughs> There's always something. So now in this context of him matching glyphs, um, this list of writing systems, Sumerian, Hieroglyphic, Hieratic, Olmec, Aramaic, Demotic, Hebrew, Mayan, and Aztec, those are all the different languages, time periods, geographical regions, and language and uh, languages, writing systems, geographical regions, and time periods that he is arbitrarily comparing glyphs in the Anton transcript to. And my question is, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to spout. I'm just going to ask you guys, <laughs> when you're looking at this chart, do you see any problems with him comparing the Aramaic language in Jerusalem that was spoken at that time when Lehi left. And, you know, 
a, a, some form of Egyptian, allegedly, to all these other languages. Do you see, do you see any problem with that? Well, the, the problem that sticks out to me a couple right away is Demotic has only been in existence 50 years. So to try to tie it into Demotic and to say that uh, these people in Jerusalem have uh, have learned Demotic uh, language is uh, is impossible. The other one is I thought in the Book of Mormon, it said that um, uh, if they could have written it in Hebrew, they would have written it in Hebrew, but Reformed Egyptian was more conformed. But according to this chart, Hebrew do doesn't even really exist yet. Um, no, in fact, they were using an Aramaic writing system in that area. But here's, here's something people really don't think about. So the black lines that are connecting um, languages above to languages below, those represent descendancy. Okay. So let's let's notice something that's kind of interesting here. We can see that Aramaic writing system descended from the hieroglyphic Egyptian, okay. right? Those black lines then tie to Aramaic, and then it picks up with heretic influences. Yes. It. Okay. Oh. So the vertical lines are showing influence and in how things evolved. Yes, and we can see that um, Demotic descended from hieratic, which is also a form of Egyptian. And we can see that Hebrew, which came later, descended from Aramaic, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm Lehi and I'm living in a place where Aramaic was broadly spoken and written, the, the writing system and language were, were common there. I would use hieroglyphic. Why would it be worse? or demonic, yeah. Yeah, why would it be worse than an earlier form that it simplified? Why would I go back to a form that was simplified to give me Aramaic? Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, that does make sense. Yeah. Logically, a person would not do that. A so Aramaic, Aramaic is already is more Demotic efficient. Is. Yeah. yeah, it's already more efficient than hieroglyphic. Uh, so why would you go back to that? Yeah, so that's one thing. Anything else stand out to you when you're looking at this? Oh, I just, I just find it really hard to see. They're so disparate to try to connect them together, to just pull the pieces out and put them into one. It just seems like a, a huge hodgepodge. I mean, how would anyone even do that or even know to do that? How would they even have access to these other languages over these time periods is kind of what I'm seeing. Yes. So that's that's a super good observation. So it's almost as if Grover doesn't understand that just because he has access to these languages right. and these extant samples big today, picture. Right. that he can randomly associate with something from the Anton transcription doesn't mean Lehi and the people who fled Jerusalem and were isolated mm -hmm. allegedly in Americas, in the Americas, had access to those things to borrow or make changes. In which case, the comparisons he's making, that Grover is making, are completely moot, right? And there's another thing here. If you look closely at um, writing systems with types and descendancy, and I'm sorry, that's a lot of information and it's sort of technical, <laughs> but you remember how I said, if you're doing an AB comparison, you can't compare an abjad to an alphabet or an alphabet to a mm -hmm. syllabary or an alphabet to a, um, a logographic system or to a semantophonetic system. All these systems that he's comparing to are of completely various and different types. So for the same reasons we were talking about before, we can't just randomly associate those languages together because they have a common squiggle. They're completely different kinds of writing systems, right? Yeah. We also have to pay attention to the fact that about, I don't know, like about right here, right at the very beginning of, oh, sorry, you can't see my cursor. <laughs> right at the very beginning of the timeline where Lehi leaves Jerusalem, he's now isolated from everything else, right? So, and, and we have some wiggle room in this chart because this, this is just 
um, dates based on extant samples that we've been able to find in modern times, right? So for example, um, the Aztec is, is clear to the right of the Lehigh timeline, but there may, you know, we don't know how far back that really could have gone because that's just where we have samples in, in the modern day. Okay. But you can kind of see how these comparisons to, to Mayan and to modern Hebrew, which actually was a descendant of Aramaic that, that Lehi would never have even known because he left Jerusalem before that happened. You can't compare to those. Lehi didn't even have those, right? They, they were either in the old world and started after he left, or they were in the new world and started after the Book of Mormon was already done, hmm. right? So Grover is not paying attention to these things. Um, and I want to show I want to show one other um, slide here really quick. I think it's called Grover Arbitrary. It seems like he has a God's eye view. He's omnipotent. He can see all of it all throughout history, all languages, and then he can choose what fits into the structure and, and what he's trying to arrive at, basically. None, none of the rest of us have that when it comes to linguistics at all. We have our little our little slice where we are and where we operate. But that God's eye view, you could make anything fit or mean anything that you wanted it to. Exactly. I mean, it's um, if we can be arbitrary, we can match anything to anything. Mm -hmm. um, so this is three examples of him being arbitrary. OK, so I'm just going to read the top one. And this is this is from page. Um, Sorry, give me one sec. This is from page uh, 48 in his paper. This whole top block is his writing, not mine. Um, the first progress made, so he's talking about Ko here again, the Mayan epigrapher. The first progress made when deciphering the Mayan language involved recognizing the numbers and then the calendrical information. That seems like a good approach to take as well with the characters document. Okay. Now, um, Ko had good reason for doing that, okay? And what Ko was doing was he was looking at this text that they didn't, they didn't understand the meaning of it, and he was seeing things that, because of the way they were sequ sequenced and because of the way they were represented, reminded him of other numerical systems that he had seen in other writing systems. And he used that not as evidence that they were numbers or evidence that um, it was the same thing, the same language. He used that as a springboard for trying to determine if in the sample he was looking at, he could explain a systemic, um, an existing systemic um, value to the glyphs he was seeing in the other language. So in other words, he was saying numbers are kind of limited in the way they work. You know, we, we have counting systems and we have ways of representing numbers. A lot of times the way numbers are represented is very um, simple because of that homeostatic thing. Again, we only, you know, depending on what base we're in, we might have between nine and, you know, 18, symbols that we can use to represent any number. It's a very small set. And the systems are very easy when you have counting, you know, it's sequential and you can see patterns very readily. So I wonder if these things that look like numbers follow a system that would allow me to demonstrate that it's consistent every time. Every, every writing sample I have in this language follows a system or a pattern that can explain a set of numbers or a number system. What Grover is doing is saying, because there is a number in language X, and because the glyph used to represent that number looks like a glyph in the Anton transcription, that means the glyph in the Anton transcription is that number. Okay, but he can never the, the way he tries to lay out the system is completely random and arbitrary. It's not a pattern-wise thing. 
So here, here he's going to explain how he did that. The following steps will be taken to evaluate numerals and numerical sequences in the document. Identify numerals that have a fairly straightforward identification from Palestinian hieratic. So why is he choosing Palestinian hieratic? He doesn't say. <laughs> identify <laughs> numerals that have a fairly straightforward identification. And I, I'm assuming by that he means they look alike from Mesoamerican sources. Why? Why Mesoamerican sources? Identify numerals that have a fairly straightforward identification from Egypt, Egyptian hieratic or demotic. Why? Why are we, why are we picking hieratic or demotic? It's, it's, it, this is random. And these three languages are very different. All of these are very different languages and writing systems. So I don't know, I don't know how there's congruency there. Four, evaluate characters that have forms similar to Mesoamerican or Egyptian hieratic or demotic variants. So now he's saying we're going to look for outliers that aren't common to these writing systems, and we're going to compare them. Evaluate the possibilities of Sumerian proto-cuneiform sources. So these are sources that existed way back in Mesopotamia, clear back as old as ancient Egypt. 3,000 like years earlier. The dynasties yeah. in ancient Egypt. Evaluate unknown numeral characters within a numeral sequence. How do we know they're numeral characters and how do we know they're in a numeral sequence? This is the cart before the horse. Evaluate characters on the ends of number sequences. How do we know it's a number sequence and how do we know where the number ends? No explanation. Throughout the process where possible, evaluate other linguistic primers that relate to the Book of Mormon. I have no idea what he means by a linguistic <laughs> primer. That might indicate or place constraints on numerals, numerical notation, and numeric sequences. Now, from reading his paper, what I gather this to mean, and, and I, I confess I'm a little confused by his, it's not a very clear um, prospect that he lays out here, but I think what he means by this is he talks about um, different numerical reckoning systems from the Book of Mormon, and then he makes some assumptions about the characters um, in the um, Anton transcription being numerical sequences or calendrical expressions or um, demarcations of eras because those things exist in the Book of Mormon. You know, they talk about the reign of the judges or they talk about the 70th and 8th year of this or that, you know. So I think that's what he's saying is that because, there's the, because we have those um, kinds of numerical expressions in the Book of Mormon, then the character's document has the same kind of numerical expressions. Hmm. So here's just two examples of the kind of comparisons that he's doing. So uh, at the bottom, in number nine, that's on page 75 of his paper, you see from the Anton sample, a stroke with four dots underneath it. And this is cosmetically somewhat like the Mayan glyph that you see below that, where you have a bar that represents five and four dots that represent ones. But how do we know that they're the same glyph? How do we know they're both representing numbers? How is this connection being made? He's not explaining any rationale behind this assignment of one thing to another. It's simply cosmetic, and therefore, he's assuming that that's a number and that it means the same as the Mayan number. On page 77, we have number 10. This is a prime example of why homeostasis requires more than just a cosmetic similarity. So when we're looking at the samples from the Anton transcript, can we even be sure that all of these are the same glyph within the Anton transcript? If you look at the one he's labeled as C70, Thanks. the diagonal stroke is not touching the vertical stroke and it's going above it, right? Yeah, those are different. It's possible that they're different. 
Yeah. Or it's just somebody writing in, you know, a sloppier way of writing the first thing. So we don't know. Yeah, so we, we aren't even hundred percent sure that those are the same glyph. Right. And now we look at another glyph and that's a hieratic example that he's, that he's claiming there. Okay. But we're talking about a two stroke glyph. So by this assignment, I have every right to say he's wrong. That's a Cyrillic L because I, I, I can associate it in exactly the same way. That's a Cyrillic L. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't and make it's a Russian sample. It doesn't make sense because he's mixing languages all over. Why would somebody be writing, mixing all these different languages? And that would make you think that Mormon or whoever's writing these knows all of these languages and is just intermixing them randomly <laughs> to, to yeah, so, spell something out. So um, Grover has, um, he's connected things without taking on the burden of explaining how they're connected. And some of the claims of connection are very disparate. They're, they're, they're separated by wide gaps of time or wide separation in geography or wide separation in writing system type or wide separation in the ability of it to fit into the context of the Book of Mormon time frame. Um, also, the Book of Mormon is quite clear. It says the, the language of the Egyptians and the teaching of the Jews. So it's difficult to understand why he's looking outside of anything that fits into the context and the time period of that. Um, so he makes these comparisons, and by making these arbitrary comparisons, he is um, pulling meaning from an arbitrarily associated glyph in another language. And then he gives that meaning as an English translation of the glyph, and he strings those all together. And by stringing those all together, he claims that he has done a translation. It's, it's a very difficult translation to follow. It doesn't really follow any real grammatical or linguistic structure and there's no there's no phonetic assignment to anything um there's no there's no identification of a overarching system that explains the translation it's simply this character in the anton transcript matches this character cosmetically in another language that character has this use or meaning in the other language therefore this is the meaning of that. And he gives that meaning in English. And he strings those, those little um, assumptions all together in order of the, of the character's um, appearance. And that is what he is calling a translation. And he does that from left to right in the order of the... Um, you know, I don't recall. I think he does it from That's right to left, but I, I, I've forgotten. I've forgotten what he did whether he does it from huh. left to right or right to left. That would have been a good thing, a good point to make, but yeah, we'll have to um, find that out. <laughs> but it really doesn't matter uh, which direction he did it. It is sequential, but it still is not. It's just a completely arbitrary set of associations that are strung together. Hmm. And again, I admire him. I mean, he had to do a lot of work to look up and compare all these glyphs, right? I respect that. That's even, in some ways, that's even a decent way to get started on a theory of what it is, what what mm. the um, Anton transcription is. But it certainly is not what's required to get to saying, I know what it is, and I've translated it. Not not by a very long shot. So does he actually say what what the Anton character said? I mean, is it <laughs> is it? A it's poem? not that straightforward. So. It's let me. I think I have the paper. I can kind of show you real quick. Oh, I don't know if I can share the screen though. Yeah, I just was curious if it actually arrived at something. Is it a poem? Is it a sonnet? Is it a? It's more like, like an interlinear. Is it a... I, I, it like it's so choppy. So he's he's claiming that it's these two excerpts from the Book of Mormon. Oh, you know, okay. Two, well, two of course it would be. Excerpts. Of course. Okay. But like when you, so he does kind of an interlinear thing. It goes this way. It doesn't go okay. this way. So he's got like, he's got like, here's the Anton glyph. Here's the glyph I'm comparing it to. Here's okay. the meaning. 
And then the next one is below that. And you just have to kind of read it. You read down the list, right? But if you took those English meanings that he's giving for each one and you kind of tidied them up and put them into like a paragraph, if you gave that to someone who didn't really know what it, what it was uh, shooting for, they'd have a hard time even making sense of what it's expressing. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So he's really making it fit. It reminds me of like, say, a serial killer putting together a note where you cut out letters from magazines and newspapers and all kinds of things. And you <laughs> put it together and it all looks different. Not that I know what a serial killer does, but I'm saying and then you, you know, like you said, if you don't know what it's supposed to say or trying to say, you can't figure it out. If you do know, you recognize it instantly in retrospect, right? You're retrofitting it basically. So, okay. I I, I sent this paper to an Egyptologist who's been listening to Mormonish, who uh, who uh, actually had a student who wanted to do a paper on uh, the Book of Abraham, and that's how she became interested in this uh, Mormonism and and uh, e Egyptology and Mormonism. And so I sent Jerry Grover's uh, book to her and said, "Would you just read this and give me some comments?" And she didn't want me to use her name, but she did respond. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll, uh, I can read you just some of the things that she yeah, said about it. This is a it. great place to read it. Yeah. She said, many of the premises are incorrect. For instance, hieroglyphs here, I will use the example of middle Egyptian, which is kind of the most well-known and reference type are not logographic. You cannot use one sign to signify a word. And thus words are far longer than one symbol. Often symbols at the end of a word determinatives will sum up an idea like a seated woman at the end of my phonetic name when spelled out. But to write my name, I need five phonetic glyphs and then one in one at the end that is a woman. So if anything, glyphs would take up more space. I recommend middle, she, then she recommends a book um, uh, for more information about it. Um, she said it's difficult to take seriously. And this is a, she's not LDS. She's not really familiar with it. No, in uh, fact, she had never even heard that the LDS um, faith believed that some of their sacred scripture was translated from Egyptian until this student brought her this project. She said, wait, what? What do you mean they look at this and see that? She'd never even encountered that before. So now she's kind of interested. Yeah, she said it's difficult to take seriously any text that made it from Israel in an Iron Age wooden submarine. Ancient books were not bound with rings. They were scrolls. I think binders are a 19th century invention, definitely far after the Middle Ages even. The assumption that Egyptian and thus Reformed Egyptian is logographic is a jump, since Egyptian was not logographic. Glyphs were not read in one direction. They were read top to bottom, left to right, right to left, and often changed mid-document to align with images. You read into the face of the birds. It's an indicator as to who who text is regarding. They didn't have quotation marks. A major premise of in this book is that things that look alike are related. That's what you just said. Mm -hmm. you that one influenced that. the other. I think it's the false equivalence fallacy. It certainly is a logic fallacy. Reformed Egyptian does not exist outside of Joseph Smith. Egyptian, the language is still spoken in Egypt by the Copts who use a modified Greek script because of Alexander the Great. The author has a faulty understanding of demotic and her heratic. It's not a regional difference in modified Egyptian. They serve different function and used in different contexts. Yep. He states that we can't read different people's handwriting in Egyptian. It is just handwriting, like how we can read different people's handwriting in English. Just because there are variations on characters based on the individual writing them, it does not mean that it is illegible. Further, cursive scripts couldn't exist if a language is purely logographic. Parts of this book are written so poorly, I do not understand the author's point. There are very few Egyptian, Heratic, and Demotic texts that Egyptologists agree on 100%. So at least this work may find good company. Words in all languages can be used in a number of ways. Uh, that is, word in an English dictionary has a number of different, different definitions. We argue about whether a preposition should be translated as in or on at conferences, for example. It works just like English, and when we disagree on translations, it works just like different interpretations of a word in an English poem would work, for instance. It is not what we disagree on how words should be interpreted as entirely. There are usually only a few options, again, just like English. Um, I am unaware of any compranda of golden plates from the ancient world. 
This is usually the main thing we focus on when analyzing whether an object is fake or not. Having no compranda means it's fake 99% of the time. Uh, I felt it necessary to write again that hieroglyphs are not mysterious. I think the author needs this to be true to make his argument. My thought on the uh, writing analyzed in this book, this does not even look vaguely like any type of Egyptian, demotic, erratic, or glyphs. Someone named Crowley assumed that the characters only represented actual Hebrew words written with Egyptian uh, phonetic characters, with the Egyptian character serving only the phonetic purpose. But the author thinks Egyptian writing is logographic, so that can't be an argument he finds useful. Neither of these individuals are correct. Um, uh, this is insane and infuriating. How could anyone believe this? Um, well, so uh, this is nonsense. Why is it so bloody long? Couldn't he have written more concise nonsense? If you use certain parts of writing from Egyptian, both erratic and demotic, Sumerian, Hebrew, Palestinian, Aztec, and Mayan writing, you can change their direction the way they were written and only take portions of the symbols, and it can look like what Joseph Smith wrote down. That is what the author is arguing, and that just cannot be taken seriously in any academic. I really stopped reading when he got to individual characters because it is a thoroughly ridiculous idea. So that's a good summary. Yeah. A good summary from <laughs> someone who just encountered this whole concept recently and is just kind of puzzled that, that this is even a thing, I think. Well, I, I do want to mention one other thing that I think is quite interesting. Um, and again, this is, I'm, a, I'm going to um, contextualize this as just my opinion. But as a conlanger, who conlangs with the best of them, <laughs> um, the Anton transcript looks a lot like the first attempt of a conlanger to create a script for a new language. Mm -hmm. They take they take what they know of their own language. This is especially true if they don't if they're not aware of linguistics or language. Like I. I'm kicking myself because I should have gone back into my files and gotten some of my the first alphabets that I created. But okay. you only know about your own writing system and your own language. And so all you do is tweak that a little bit to make it look like something slightly different, right? That's that's what that document looks like to me as a conlanger. It looks like a conlanger's first attempt at creating a writing system. And I think it was Dan Vogel who did a video on it where he actually makes a really good, if I'm remembering it right, and it is him, he makes this really good sort of progression of how, how those characters, um, like it's almost like he gets inside Joseph Smith's head a little bit about how he's just making these up from Roman characters, right? Yeah. And he, yeah. he does it in such a good, it's such a, like it's he's not proving anything, but it's it shows you how plausible it is that it could just be made up from from mm -hmm. Roman text, and that it doesn't mean anything. It's just shapes that were borrowed from Roman text and tweaked to make them look exotic, right? Um, I I think that we have a long way to go before anyone is going to know anything about that sample, except that it contains some glyphs. And that it came from Joseph Smith and that they did take it to Anton and have him look at it. And that's all we know. That's it. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything else about it unless we fill the gap with faith. Right. Which I personally am not willing to do because I find faith to be dangerous and risky. Um, so that's, you know, that's the bottom line when it comes to the Anton transcription, in my opinion. Did we finish all your points on that other slide? I think so. Yeah. Can we, we, can we go, go back to that, Landon? We can maybe end on that. So. Yeah. I just love that whole process of the dots. I think that's invaluable. I think that you can take that and use that for anything that you're just trying to discover the truth of for yourself. Let's see. Number six. Um, is it reasonable to conclude that similar glyphs in Egyptian or other writing systems establish a link between those writing systems and the glyphs in the Anton transcription? No, a large sample and systemic correspondence is necessary to rule out mere coincidence. So I think we already, we showed the, um, 
the slide that shows the danger of cosmetic similarity assumptions. And yeah, that's he's he's basically just um, making random associations because of cosmetic similarities between glyphs in multiple languages. Um, there was one other quick thing I wanted to mention. Um, one of the things I really wish when, when we're talking about this kind of dot structure where we, we start out with a claim and we're trying to work our way by asking questions over to some confirmation and we're not allowing faith to fill in the holes. Um, part of the reason why I frame the way I was trained from birth as a form of slavery is because I was robbed of, first of all, of informed consent, but more importantly, of the fact that I, I always had the right and the obligation to test and explore the claims that I was given from birth. And if you imagine a culture where people are doing what humans have to do, they're taking what they were given by their parents, doing their best to to, to pass it down to their children so that their children can can have it too and 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 survive at least as well as they did with their parents. If we package that along with the mandate that you have the right and obligation to test any of this, you can question it, you can improve it, you can refine it, you can throw the stuff out that doesn't seem to work. You can you can ask why? Why do we do this? Why do we believe this? What makes this important? What makes this functional? And if you don't find good answers, you can let it go. You can replace it with something else. But I was given the mandate opposite of that. I was told, this is the only way to do it. This is the only safe way. These are the right things. Everything else is wrong. You're going to come to a sticky end if you don't do it this way. You'll be punished if you don't do it this way. You'll be blessed and rewarded and praised if you do it this way. Um, it was it was sealed in a way that made me a slave. And the tragedy of that is my parents are not responsible for that and neither are their parents or their parents. It was the original creators of this that as a part of it insidiously made it that self-sealed kind of system of faith belief that takes an existential crisis to escape so that you don't want to escape it. Something bad has to happen to you. And I, I mentioned this um, to Rebecca earlier, but it's kind of like you're on a ski slope and an avalanche starts and you're one of the privileged people who is already skiing in the same direction of the avalanche at the same speed. So you just kind of float above it. It just gets you to the bottom faster and you got a cool story to tell. But all the people who were going side to side on the ski slope or who were stationary or who didn't know there was an avalanche coming they get pummeled and, and destroyed by it. So it's great to keep the beliefs and it's great. And, you know, people a lot of the time say faith is harmless. It's just people, you know, it's just good things and, and teaching people to feed the poor and hungry and all that. But the truth is that's only true for the people who don't have something that forces the disruption of it and rips it out from under them. And a lot of people disaffected from the LDS church they're not turning towards something and leaving the LDS church. The LDS church is failing them in a moment of crisis and compounding the moment of crisis by ripping away everything that they believed was true. And the fact that that's the structure means those people were never free. They were never making the decisions on their own. At least they're going to bring it back to me. I wasn't. I wasn't making the decisions on my own. I was obeying. And I do not see that as a venerable or even pragmatic human need anymore to, to involve faith. I think it, at the point where our species is, it's actually kind of a dangerous, harmful thing. And it's, it's responsible for a lot of bad stuff that happens. And it can coincidentally cause good too, but you don't need it for the good. You don't. Very so important. anyway, that's, that's my, my final thought. Wow, about that's that. very powerful. <laughs> that's amazing. Do you have any final thoughts, Landon? This has just been an incredible presentation and we appreciate, you know, your scholarly insights and also just your personal insights and this, this framework.
that I think you've given me, I think everybody else, sort of a new way to look at things, to figure out kind of what happened to us and how we can use some of these strategies going forward. So, wow, this has just been amazing. What do you think, Landon? We we focused on kind of the Anton transcript mm -hmm. and Anton characters today. Um, Trent has some additional information on uh, Nahum uh, yeah. and some of these other things. So we'd like to, you know, do another episode For with sure. some of that and, and yeah. hit some of that stuff as well, because it's important that these, these uh, ideas or these uh, what what the church is telling us are truths that are thrown mm -hmm. out there and to we're told these are evidences need to be peer reviewed by other people who are willing to look at them objectively and aren't just saying, hey, this isn't, uh, you know, aren't trying to prove that they're true. They're looking at them objectively. And that's why we asked Trent. That's why we sent this to the Egyptologist to get uh, their their take on it is we want it to be peer reviewed by people who don't have an agenda that are reviewing it. So we appreciate it, Trent. Yeah. It was a pleasure. I love I love talking about language and linguistics. It's always fun. <laughs> well, we're just really happy that we bumped into you. I mean, if we were praying people, we would have said our prayers are answered. But whatever it is, <laughs> the universe sent more Manisha <laughs> linguish to talk to a linguish. Look, I can't even speak Link. my own language to speak to. So and yeah, we definitely want to come have you back on to talk about some of the other things that we discussed that just time wise we ran out. But I think the way that we we did all this, especially talking about your personal faith exploration. And some of that was really important to include. So I love that. So this is excellent. All right, everybody, please comment. What did you guys think about this? Oh my goodness. Um, I was blown away by the faith chart. What, what are your thoughts on that? And some of the other information just about the Anton characters and, and some of that, it was just so fascinating. I just love it. And really excited to have Trent back on at some point, uh, please like, and subscribe to Mormonish podcast. And if you'd like to be made aware when new episodes come out, you can hit that notification bell. If you'd like to financially support Mormonish podcast, there are links in the show notes to Venmo, PayPal, mormonishpodcast.org. And we, we just honestly could not continue to put out content without all of you. So um, we really appreciate all, all of you that are able to contribute to help um, support us financially. We just we just really appreciate you guys for that. And um, we also have a link, a new newer link in the show notes to Mormonish merch, right, Landon? Hold up your oh, mug. <laughs> I got uh, I have some other stuff here too. Let me think. But, oh, I have a water bottle, don't I? I have a couple different yeah, things. You got anyway, we have some fun Mormonish merch. There's a link in the show notes if you guys feel like uh, wearing your Mormonish proud, right? There you go. There's a hat. So <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Landa, for co-hosting. And thanks, Trent, again. And we will catch you all next time on Mormonish. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.